Hey, today I wanted to show you the wondrous world of animation. So what is animation? Well, it's a good thing you asked. Animation is the sequencing of imagery to produce the illusion of movement. Or, the less pretentious way of putting it, would be drawing a bunch of pictures to make something look like it moves. Humans have got really good at this. We use digital animation in our movies, TV shows, and games to express creative ideas and enhance our storytelling. So how do we go from a static drawing into a fully animated video or GIF? Well, the first step is to add frames to the artwork, using your program of choice. After we've modified these duplicate frames, we can display them back to back, each for a certain period of time. We call the number of frames shown in one second the frame rate, which leads me into my first major point. Timing. Standard television is around 24 frames a second, so one of the most common frame rates for animating pixel art is 12 frames a second, which you'll notice is half the speed of 24. People like to refer to animating on every second frame as animating on twos. For beginners and even pros, I think that 12 frames a second is a fantastic choice because the more frames you have means more work, but less frames can be less smooth, and 12 frames a second walks that line perfectly. But how do we draw when we want to make these adjustments to every frame across this 12 FPS animation? Well, here's the simple concept. The number of pixels moved between frames determines the speed, because, you know, speed equals distance divided by time. Also be mindful of how long a frame will be displayed. It's usually shorter than you think, because you'll spend some time looking at it while you draw. And for us on 12 FPS, it'll be a twelfth of a second. I think it's time for part two, which I'm gonna call planning. It's one of those things that no one likes to do, but it really enables you to create much better animations in half the time. Don't get me wrong, I never liked to plan out the movements for my animations, until I realized how useful it was. It's so easy to get lost trying to create animations from a static sprite by shifting pieces around and playing with individual pixels, but this often results in an awkward animation. Animation isn't about the lighting or the character. Animation is about movement. We need to separate the aesthetic of the static image from its movement, and focus only on that movement. Once we have the really nice foundation of good movement, we can begin to put the skin back on the character. Instead of investing time and energy into polishing every frame as we go, the best way is to simplify the subject into its most primitive shapes and make these shapes move fluidly. For a humanoid character, that would be a different colored shape for each limb. For fabric or cloth, create a chain of dots with delayed reactions to the movement of the dot above. Each segment reacts like links in a chain, but once you average out the movement with a curved line, it can be used for anything organic. So it's kind of like drawing the skeleton of your character. Sometimes you want an object to jump or fall. Probably one of the most overused cliches of animation tutorials, besides the slime, is the bouncing ball. They always show a curved parabola to demonstrate the path of the ball. I never saw myself actually drawing this line for an animation. But it's just one of those planning things that really helps improve the final product. And, more importantly, ease the process. I would 100% recommend drawing a quick line for the path of your animation. Because then you only have to think about the object's speed and not the path. I think I've said enough about planning. Yes, it can be a pain, but it's a much better alternative to having to start a high fidelity animation all over again from scratch. Here are some quick tips to improve your actual animation and movement. Because I haven't really talked about how to improve your motion yet. For a weapon attack, a common mistake is to depict every single frame. You can see as this axe is swung, there are five unique frames as it's held at different angles. The point is, sometimes you want impact. To make your movement nice and crunchy, don't worry about drawing so many frames, just do a couple. If something is moving that fast, it won't be on screen for very long. Of course, this can look choppy, so a remedy for fewer frames is a technique called smearing. Smearing acts like motion blur does in real footage, by stretching the object into a blotch of color that signifies direction. This shape tells us both the speed and the direction the subject is moving. Like a lot of things, smearing is good in moderation. Before a drastic movement, winding up or providing some anticipation frames can be a super nice touch. You can hold these frames for as long as you want. Something else that also sells impact is secondary animation. Secondary animation is where things in your world react to the primary movement. Think of it like cause and effect. If a heavy thing is dropped here, these lighter things might jump up because of it. Okay, I want to talk to you about easing in and out. If there's one thing to take away from this video, it would be easing in and out. To ease in and out, exponentially decrease the distance your sprite moves for the start and end of its movement. This will make it accelerate and decelerate, and therefore feel more lifelike. Like we said before, the common rule is that the distance between frames will determine the speed, so the way you arrange these distances will influence your object's acceleration. 
Compress your distances so it moves 1 or 2 pixels at the start and 8 or 9 in the middle. But what if you want to move something slower than 1 pixel per frame? An advanced technique we can use allows us to move half a pixel without actually breaking the bounds of the pixel grid. It's called subpixel animation and it's useful to smooth out subtle animations like idle animations. But how do we do it? We need to add more frames to the animation and go to the pixel level, smearing and smoothing individual pixel transitions. We're leaving traces of these small pixels to simulate a blur effect and the illusion of half pixels. Consider it the anti-aliasing of animation. We can also use the outline or shape of the subject to our advantage, editing its form to improve smoothness. Here's the original sprite moving up and down one pixel, and here is the zoomed in selection of just one of the sprite's pixels moving up and down. It's like a switch, isn't it? On, off, on, off. Expanding the number of frames used, a value can be used to transition between full color and transparency for each pixel, given the effect of smooth motion. Overshooting is when your subject goes just that little bit too far with their movement. It can help make your subject look more animated or lively. Nonetheless, a nice technique to have in your toolbox. And remember, it can be used for animating inanimate objects. Another thing that I've seen beginners do, and something that I've done myself, is to restrict a character's movement and not go very big with the swings and walks. Always go for over-exaggerated, bigger movements. It takes time and planning, but it's a much better alternative to a walk cycle with only a one pixel shift in the legs. And when designing your character, gives them features that will allow your eye to track the right details to help with clarity. Wow, there's so much to learn. So much for me to learn too. Well, hopefully you'll join me on my journey as we learn how to become pixel art pros together.